Okay, we're good to go. I'm going I'm to go ahead and start the webinar right now. Okay. We got go. sound. We're all good. Sound. We can hear. All right. I got the recording in progress. I guess we can proceed. Okay. Good evening. Let's call to order the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting of 18 August 2022 at 6.31 p.m. Before we get started, I'd like to remind commissioners of some procedural items for this meeting. During the meeting, participants should remain muted when not speaking. If participants have a question or a comment, please use the raise hand feature. Speakers will be called upon to speak one at a time. A random order voice vote will be administered by the city staff for each vote. The Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting is being conducted utilizing teleconferencing and electronic means as allowed by the Government Code sub Subdivision 54953E and Resolution 1089-21, most recently reaffirmed by the City Council on August 9th, 2022. Members of the public may provide audio public comment by connecting to the teleconference meeting online or by telephone, use the raise hand feature to request to speak or star nine on the telephone. Teleconference meeting details are available on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting agenda. Captions are available for viewers accessing this meeting via Zoom. Captions can be displayed or hidden using the live transcript button. Comments on matters not on the agenda must be submitted prior to the time the chair calls the item for oral communications. Comments on the agenda items must be submitted prior to the time the chair closes the public hearing on the agenda item. Speakers are requested to keep their comments to no more than three minutes and time limits will be enforced. Guidelines are posted on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting agenda. City staff, may we please have the roll call? Um, quick question. I, I think I saw Dan Hafman in the public uh, Zoom. Yeah, if he's that... in the if, if he's in the um, waiting area, bring him in. Okay, I oh, will bring him in. Is he in? I don't see him on the participants list. It, did he, uh, is he showing as an attendee and not as a panelist? I saw him in the attendees and- uh, Maybe he dropped, oh, there he is. Now his name's appearing. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take the roll call right now. Right, um, is it noted uh, that Commissioner Hafman uh, joined the meeting at 6.33 p.m. And Commissioner Hafman, please rename yourself appropriately. And now we shall resume with the roll call. Commissioner Hafman. Present. Vice Chair Beagle. Present. Present. Chair Melman. Present. Commissioner Owe. Present. Commissioner Mel Melinger. Present. Commissioner Bonet. Here. Commissioner Dave. Present. So we have seven present tonight. Okay, great. Um, so um, city staff, do we have any um, presentations? Um, tonight we have two presentations. Okay. The first one is um, on the active transportation progress update. Excellent. Proceed. Um, so good evening. Tonight, I'm going to provide an update on the implementation of the recommendations identified in the active transportation plan. Next, please. Here's the agenda for tonight's presentation. First, I will give you a background of the ATP. Then we'll go through some of the completed, in progress, and future projects um, related to bike path and safe route to school improvements. And lastly, lastly, we'll go over some of the next steps. Next, please. Next. The Active Transportation Plan, or ATP for short, was adopted by City Council about two years ago in August 2020. It is a comprehensive planning document that includes the bicycle plan, pedestrian plan, and safe route to school plan. 
the ATP serves as a guide for City Council to consider future actions and approve grants application. Next, please. The ATP's vision statement focuses on providing a connected, comfortable, safe, and convenient network designed for all ages and ability. And we aim to increase active transportation mode share to 10% by 2030. By 2030. Next, please. Some of the bicycle improvement projects that were completed in the last year include installing um, various different types of bike facilities within the city, including class two bicycle lane, 2B buffer bike lane, and class three bicycle routes. Um, so here's a list of locations where these projects have been implemented, um, bicycle facilities have, have been implemented. Next, please. As part of the Safe Route to School Improvement Projects near Homestead High School, we converted a portion of bicycle lanes on Homestead um, Road to include a buffer. And we also in installed new bicycle ramps at the southwest corner of Mary Avenue and Homestead Road, which connects to the Mary Avenue um, bridge over the in Interstate 280. Next, please. Although the list of completed projects is, isn't very long, we do have a pretty long list of in-progress projects. In the Moffitt Park area, specific plan area, the Java Drive Road Diets and the buffer bike lane on Caspian Way will start construction later this year. Class 2B buffer bike lane on Geneva Drive and Class 1 multi-use path, which is known as the Green Link, um, and a photo of that is being shown on the right, on Gibraltar Drive, uh, currently under construction. Next, please. Also, uh, Manila Drive and Moffitt Park Drive Class 1 multi-use trail is in progress. Other in-progress projects include the installation of bicycle lanes on Sunnyville Avenue between Handy and Mott, and convert conversion of Class 2 bike lane to 2B buffer bike lane on Boregas Avenue between Mott and Awani. And on Mott Avenue between the Western City Limits and Matilda Avenue, um, we will be installing um, 2B buffer as well, and um, as well as two-stage bike turn boxes at three intersections. Um, at the intersection of Mott at Makara, Mott and Mary, and Mott at, at um, Pastoria. Next, please. As part of the Civic Center project, we'll be installing Class 1 bike um, path, Class 1 multi-use path on, south, on the southbound direction on Matilda between Olive and El Camino, Real. The installation of Class 2B buffer bike lane on Willow Avenue will start construction later this year. And we are also installing um, Class 3B buffer um, bicycle boulevard on various streets as part of the 2022 slurry seal and pavement rehabilitation project. Next, please. So the following in progress projects have both a bike and, um, and pedestrian components, um, including the Mary Avenue overcrossing, Caltrain Gray Separation, Bernardo Avenue overcrossing, Stevens Creek Trail Extension and a class one multi-use trail at the new intuitive surgical sites on Kiefer at Commercial. Next. On to future projects, um, we have the pedestrian and bicycle facility installation on Passman Drive projects um, that, that is upcoming. Also, we have East Channels um, Trail Study, Evelyn, Ave Evelyn Avenue class one trail and Mod Avenue class 2B conversion between Sunnyvale Avenue and Fair Oaks Avenue. Next, please. We have implemented um, approximately two miles of bicycle facility last year. But as I mentioned earlier, um, we are working, we're currently working on a long list of uh, projects. So for next year's update, you should expect to see uh, more miles of bicycle facilities that will be implemented. Next, please. On to pedestrian improvement projects, we have installed the first pedestrian scramble signal at Mary and Homestead. We have um, also in installed accessible pedestrian signal system with touchless but, uh, push button at two new locations. More than 100 um, new ADA compliant curb ramps were installed in last year. And the installation of new sidewalk and street lights and upgrade to existing sidewalks were also implemented by various development um, projects. Next, please. Some of the in-progress pedestrian project improvement projects include the bicycle and pedestrian safety improvements at Fremont, Manet, and Bob White, removal of Potchop Islands at the intersections of Maud Avenue at Matilda and at Borregas, 
we are also working on um, providing a quick build pedestrian pathway on Marion Way. Next, please. In the Peary Park specific plan area, we will be installing new street lights and sidewalks on Petrol Avenue. In the Lawrence Station area, we'll be implementing crosswalk improvements at the intersections of Reed and Willow and Reed and Avalon. Um, also, we will be installing a new pedestrian scramble signal at the intersection of Duane, Stewart's, and Indian Wells Avenue. Next, please. We will be installing temporary pedestrian pathway on Poplar Avenue near Peterson Middle School. And we are also going to be looking at ways to um, install permanent sidewalk on the east side of this corridor. We are going to be upgrading in roadway pavement lightings at a few intersections. And we will be installing a new rectangular rapid flashing beacon at the intersections of California and Pajaro. Next, please. For upcoming pad related projects, we have the Sunnyvale Caltrain Station bike and pad access study, and we'll continue to require new land use development projects to install new sidewalk and ADA compliant curb ramps and street lights along their project frontage as needed. Next, please. Um, on to safe route to school improvements. We have a few projects going on, um, including bicycles, um, pedestrian, and safe route to school improvements, quick build projects, which we're gonna have um, improvements at a number of schools in Sunnyvale, near a number of schools in, uh, in Sunnyvale. The Snail Neighborhood Active Transportation Connect Connectivity Pro Improvement Projects is gonna be implementing improvements near San Miguel Elementary S School and Columbia Middle School. And VTA is also leading a um, the Homestead Road to Safe Route to School Improvement Projects on Homestead. Next, please. For future um, projects, we have the pedestrian and safe route to school improvements in um, Snail and Brawley Corner neighborhoods, as well as um, we're going to be looking for ways to implement improvements near um, all public, uh, safe route to school improvements near all public schools serving Sunnyview students. Um, next, please. For next steps, um, we will continue to implement bicycle, pedestrian, and safe route to school improvements through capital improvement projects, um, annual slurry seal and pavement rehabilitation projects, and land use development projects. We will continue to look for grant funding opportunities to implement the recommendations identified in the ATP and to, to continue deliver um, other funded bicycle and pedestrian projects. Next, please. Um, as a reminder, you can find a copy of the ATP report on the city website under the transportation and traffic safety page. Um, th this concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Sang. I, I will, since we remain in a virtual setting, I will remind my colleagues to use a virtual raise hand feature to indicate that they uh, wish to speak. Um, I noticed that we do have questions and feedback uh, from the commissioners. So Commissioner Bonet, I believe, was first, um, and everybody else raised their hands so simultaneously that I'm just going to go and and Commissioner Mellinger next, because that's who's next after Commissioner Bonet alphabetically in my list here. Thank you, Chair Mellon. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sang, for the report. That was, that was a very illuminating summary. I have one basic question on, on timing and schedule of implementation of these projects. Uh, you noted that in the past fiscal year, little more than two miles have been implemented. Do you see that number accelerating in the future? And if so, to what to what number? So um, so since the adoption of the ATP, um, some of the recommendations that were in, you know that were recommended in the ATP, it takes time to actually get funding and then do a study, do the design and construction. Therefore, in the first couple of years, we don't expect to see a lot of improvements, you know, that would take place right away. Um, so, you know, as you can see, we do have a lot of in-progress projects. That's because, you know, since the adoption of the ATP, we started working on, you know, to working on identify, identifying fundings um, and then moving on to the, the next steps. So um, in the upcoming years, you will continue to see more projects delivered. Very good. Thank you. And the, the next part is is a related question. What is really the greatest time consumer in getting a project to the construction phase? Um, I'm sorry. Can you can you explain? So the, 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 you mentioned a, a, a set of mm -hmm. different procedures through which each project must go. 
from idea to finished construction. What is the what's the longest element in there in your experience? So it depends on how big the project is. I mean, some of them requires a longer study. Um, some of them does require some form of outreach that could take longer. And then um, in and and if we don't have the funding, we also need to look for fundings as well. And as in, in the last couple of years um, since the pandemic, we also see the supply chain issue that it is taking a lot longer to obtain some of the um, equipments and materials um, needed to construct. So we do. So one of the one of the um, ish, you know one of the challenges we have been having is um, is the is the equipment obtaining the actual materials and and and, and equipment. Thank you. So the answer is all of the above. <laughs> That's the end of my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bonet. Next is Commissioner Mellinger, followed by Bryce, Bryce, Vice Chair Beagle, who needs to rename himself. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Melman. Uh, so I've got a few questions here. Um, uh, actually, I've also got some comments, but I'll save those for after public comment. Um, the Pajaro intersection, is that still slated to be beginning construction uh, this year? I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I just noted that on the active items list, it said some late summer, and it is now late summer. Um, okay. Um, so is there, do we have numbers on how much has been spent implementing the ATP so far and a remaining cost, the remaining cost estimate to implement? Um, in terms of numbers, we do not have that because a lot of the projects actually have multiple components. It's not only benefiting, you know, bike and pet sure. and they brought to school. It does, you know, it does have other components as well. As well. So we don't have, um, we haven't had a way to kind of separate out the individual components. Okay. Um, so... Can you speak a little more about where the Sunnyvale Caltrain uh, study issue is at? That one, we have submitted all the necessary paperwork to Caltrain, Caltrans. And so on, um, on Caltrain District 4 is, and I, I actually Caltrain, Caltrain is actually working on the funding agreement right now. So, okay. um, so they, the anticipated, I think they're gonna, um, they expect to provide us the agreement sometime in October. And is Caltrans or Caltrain? Caltrans. Caltrans. Trans. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we anticipate to start having the funding available to us um, later this year, perhaps in November. Okay. Um, so a citizen recently emailed the uh, Department of Traffic and CC'd me on it about the possibility of getting flex posts outside of Bishop to stop cars from uh, drivers from parking in the bike lane during pickup and drop off. And uh, if I recall correctly, you know, there's still issues with the street sweeping that is blocking the implementation of protected bike lanes, class four bike lanes. What is the situation with street sweeping and class four bike lanes? We've been hearing this for some time and I, I'd be curious if there's been any progress or movement on getting uh, street sweeper capabilities for the class fours that we have planned? It is a project that is on our work plan. Um, we haven't had the um, bandwidth to start working on the project, but it is something that we do plan on starting um, in the next year or so. Okay. Um, and I believe that does it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Mellinger. And next is uh, Vice Chair Beagle, followed by Commissioner Haifman. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, on slide five, you say the goal is to increase active transportation mode split by 10%. I've got a number of questions related to that. Like, what does uh, mode split mean in this context? Is that like number of trips, number of miles? Uh, what is the 10% relative to? Like, is there a, a start date? Uh, and like, what is the current number? And do we have 
like, are we expecting to hit this with our current rate of like improvements? Uh, um, let's see. So in the when we developed the active transportation plan, um, the most share. So the most share is really the percentage of Sunnyville residents and um, employees who use the different type of transportation mode. So which includes driving, um, walking, bicycling, um, taking transit, um, or using um, carpool, you know, like the various different types of modes. So by this, um, we are looking, you know, by trans active transportation mode, we are looking at biking, walking, and perhaps, you know, the other type of um, active transportation um, equipments, you know, using scooters or something like that. So that's what um, that definition is. And when we developed the active transportation plan, I believe back in 2017, um, the moat share was about 1.5 or 1.7%. So our goal is to increase it to 10%. One like, more. <laughs> increase to 10%, not to increase 1.7 by 10%. No, it is increased to 10%, correct? Okay. And in terms of the current um, mode share, so it is something that um, the city doesn't necessarily have a lot of ways to collect that data. Um, the census, the US census typically would collect this type of data, um, especially with um, part of the journey to work survey. And then um, um, every few years, the county's uh, public health would also um, publish a report that report this kind of data. Okay. Uh, and do we, and maybe you said it, but are we expecting to hit this by 2030 at our current rate? Or do we, we just don't? <laughs> like, okay. But um, and then this was number of trips, not miles, correct? This is number of users, yes. Okay. Um, the next question I have is, do we have any like minimum build uh, requirements for the ATP? So like if a construction occurs on a street somewhere, do we have an expectation that it will be updated to match the ATP? Or is it all done through discrete projects outside of normal construction? Um, can you explain your question again? So like if if we're repaving a road for some reason, uh, is there an expectation that that like just because it's happening, we're also going to be updating it to meet active trans the ATP plans of like bike lanes or anything? Or are they are ATP improvements just completely separate that they have to be initiated manually? So it depends on the type of improvements. Like you know, you know, as, a, as, a, as an example, if it's a slurry steel project, we will review um the ATP and the safe route to school plan. Um, you know, the, the both the bike bike path plan and path plan and safe route to school plan to see if there's any striping improvements that we could implement. That doesn't necessarily, you know, these improvements that we could implement as part of these projects wouldn't um would be the ones that does not require us a, a you know a study. So if a project requires a study, then we won't be able to implement it as part of um, a slurry seal project. Uh, can you go into detail what you mean by like requires a study? Like shouldn't the ATP kind of like... So ATP <laughs> is a planning document. So it doesn't, it, it didn't include any of like technical analysis. Um, for example, if we are looking at potentially um, doing a road diet, um, to implement any bike facilities, then a, a, a study is needed to see if a road diet could, could actually be implemented in terms of, you know, the number of, of vehicles that are going to be, that are using that road currently and also in the future. Okay. Another example would be um, removal of on-street parking. We would need to do like a on-street parking study to see where they're, um, you know, what the usage, usage is and so forth. Okay. Which, based on the analysis and the public outreach, then, um, then you know, staff will prepare a recommendation based on the data outreach and everything else. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, and then can you pull up slide 14, the one with the table again? 
I'm a bit confused on what the proposed remaining on that table, or that slide, the, the, the table means. Is that just what has been proposed for the year? Is that like an actual plan? Like this is going to happen by the end of the year? Um, or is it just like, we want to do this, but nothing is set in stone? So um, let's see, the first column has all the different type of facilities. The second column was what was identified in the ATP as existing at the time. So that was existing as of, can you um, do full screen? Mm -hmm. So the second column was the actual facility my, number of miles on the ground in 2020. And then, so 20, so the third column it was, is what was implemented. And um, so you could, and um, the current is existing plus what was implemented this year and what was implemented the year prior. Okay. So I, like, if I look at the class one, mm -hmm. like 18 plus 0 0.1 is not 19. So it's not because we did implement some of them in fiscal year 20 to 21. Okay, got it. And then proposed remaining. It, it, so on, on the active transportation plan itself, um, you can find a table six on page 56, I believe. So that table has what was existing at the time, what was what is being proposed and um, what would be the future be, be, you know, at the build out of the ATP for the bike facilities. So okay. the proposed remaining comes from, you know, what was proposed to be built back then and what has been implemented thus far. Okay, so if I'm reading this properly, by the end of the proposal for the ATP, there's going to be about 180 miles, 170 miles of, wait, 97, yeah, 180 miles mm -hmm. of bike stuff. Do we have the, a metric for the total number of, like, non-residential streets that a bike lane could potentially go on? Uh, uh, but we don't have that data. Because I'm curious, like, what percentage of the city this covers in terms of street miles? No, we do not have that data readily available. OK. Mm -hmm. OK, I think that's just, it. Uh, just to be clear also, the, the total mileage is not adding up the existing in 2020 plus the proposed. Because um, in the ATP, there are some streets that get converted Mm -hmm. from a class two and a, into a class four. So it's it's not a one for one addition. So some of them, so the numbers are off a little bit in that sense because of conversions of different types. <clears throat> yeah, so okay. if you look at the table in 50, on page 56, I believe there is uh, like the in for the future after things are implemented, class two actually has decreased, yeah. will be decreased. The table, Page the table in, uh, that Lillian's referring to is the more accurate uh, figure to look at if you want to see the total at build out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's the last of my questions. Yes. Thank you, so thank Vice you Chair answers. Beagle. Commissioner Haifman, followed by Commissioner Wee, and then I'm sorry, Commissioner DeVay, you're last on the list. <laughs> Good, and is thanks. there some reason why we don't have camera for Vice Chair Beagle and Commissioner Wee? Thank you. I'm uh, my camera is, or my laptop is having some problems right now and turning up the okay. camera is speeding okay. up some processing. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Sang. Um, I actually have one question I think you answered. The, the class two declined a little bit mm -hmm. because it went somewhere else. Where did it go? Did it go to 2B? Yes. That's what I figured, okay. Um, I also had a question on the safe routes to school. There's no discussion about the Carson and Mary Hawk signal or even a crosswalk at that intersection across Mary. Is that still on the list? It is still on the list. That was one of the projects that we applied for funding for. And so we currently don't have the actual funding for it. Where, uh, that was one that we applied for a grant. Okay. Um, and also, just to confirm, the proposed remaining, mm -hmm. in, again, on the table on page 14, mm -hmm. that actually comes directly from the ATP, right? Um, minus what have been implemented. Minus? In the, you know, in the last two years. 
well, proposed remaining, that means it hasn't been implemented yet. Exactly. Right? So, so if you look at the table, I guess next year I'll include more information in this table <laughs> to avoid confusion. But if you look at the ATP um, on page 56, uh, let me see if I could pull it up really quickly. Um, so in that table, there's actually a um, existing as of 2022, what is being proposed, you know, if we were to implement all the bike improvements per the plan. And so the, the delta is what's being proposed by the ATP. So we took that number and minus anything that ha we have implemented thus far. Okay. So basically, if everything in the ATP, say, say for class one, got implemented, mm -hmm. then the proposed remaining would be zero. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the last question I have is, how did you come up with the 10% mode shift number? That was a goal that was identified um, when during the development of the ATP. I believe it was something that EPAC recommended. <laughs> with what we negotiated, it wasn't necessarily the, the level that we wanted, but I think it was what we negotiated. Okay. Because I was wondering, if, if you look at from a climate action plan, I hate to say it, but it's below noise level. If you look at the total carbon footprint of the city, you're just changing the mode shed by, by 10% or increasing it to 10%, where 90% is still people driving cars. That doesn't look real encouraging. I mean, portion of it would be taking transit. Portion of it would be, you know, carpooling. It's, it, it's removing single occupancy vehicles, Commissioner Hafeman, so um, into other forms of transportation. And it's a floor. It's not a ceiling. Understand. But yeah. It's going to be tough to meet the floor, but I'm just saying that that number by itself doesn't do anything for climate change. Um, okay, that completes my question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hafeman. Um, Commissioner um, We and then Commissioner Deve. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and my camera was off because I was uh, eating because I didn't have enough time oh. to <laughs> summit in the house. I needed to get some food so I could keep functioning. Okay, I thought maybe you had an issue, so. That okay. was the issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Need calories. Okay. Um, let's see. Regarding um, slurry seals, I, I want to make sure I get my nomenclature correct. So there, I've, I've um, there's been a lot of discussion in the bike groups about chip seals versus slurry seals versus cape seals versus a lot of seals around. <laughs> what exactly is a slurry seal versus a chip seal versus say a, a cape seal? Could you help educate me a little bit? Mr. Ng. <laughs> <laughs> so the <clears throat> so sorry, the differences between all the different treat maintenance treatments, uh, slurry seal is basically applying a layer of asphalt oil on top of the existing pavement. I kind of call it in my simple way of describing it to people is just applying lotion to the roadway. It helps add in oils back into the roadway so that it holds holds together a little bit better. Over time and age, as the cars drive over, trucks drive over the pavement, it pulls off uh, the oil and causes everything to dry out with weather and vehicle traffic. Chip seal is asphalt oil plus a little bit of small rocks on top. So it adds a, a new wearing layer. So it's like as time ages, your clothes start wearing uh, wearing and then you replace a new layer on top. Cape seal, um, in our case, is the way we define it as double chip seal, which is um, we put on a layer of oil with aggregate rock, and then a year later we come in and put another layer of oil on top just to lock in the, the rock so that it doesn't kick loose. And then what we found is that there's been a lot of complaints with people when we do just regular chip seal because the rocks are loose, people as they're driving around tend to kick it up, bicycles kick it up, and it becomes a little slippery. So for Sunnyvale, we've kind of gone to double chip seal. And then there's um, other seals like uh, microsurfacing, <clears throat> which is 
not as much as it's still adding a layer on top, but it's a different process which cures. And that's what the County Expressway uses. And then, then you start getting into the more invasive type things like um, AC overlays, mill and fills and reconstruction or rubberized asphalt treatment where you're actually grinding off a layer, like two to three inches of pavement and then replacing it with a brand new um, layer of, of asphalt. And then the difference between all of this is that, and I'm sorry, I'm going into all this, but the oh, difference between all this <laughs> is when you do surf maintenance type treatments, which is slurry seal. And um, then my, what happens is you don't need to bring up streets to ADA improvements because they're classified as maintenance type activities. When we do AC overlays, uh, we have to install ADA ramps as part of the projects. And then that's a federal requirement. And then also as the, the color of money plays into uh, on a role in, in what we do. So if it's like gas tax, we can do whatever we want with it. Uh, federal funds, we have to meet federal requirements for that money. Wow, thank you so much. That was very educational. I learned a lot there. The feeling we need a separate presentation on all this just so we can learn about it. <laughs> yeah, like a little fact up in our transportation page about these, what Sunnyvale does and why we do that. That, that was very informational. I'd like to catch that video clip and post it because that was really interesting. <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see, regarding, um, let's see, the, um, with transportation bikeway mileage, I really like the question that Commissioner Beagle asked about um, measuring, so how many miles we have currently versus how many miles are not there yet. So we see a metric of how far we're going. How, how much effort would that be to measure that? To measure how much we currently have and how well, much we may we, we have how much we have currently, but we've got um, all these tracks that don't have any treatment or any you know help that, we have a space that don't have um, even our active transportation plan. Just look at those streets, what we recommended in there. It'd be nice to um, see where we are in our thermometer of where we're going. I, although I guess the proposed remaining, that's all in the active transportation plan? Correct. Okay, so we don't have a measurement of stuff beyond our active transportation plan. We haven't even included there yet, as it were, that mm -hmm. of basically non-residential streets that don't have bicycle facilities on them. I guess Hollenbeck would be the, the classic one that's currently, you know, not in. <laughs> we, we know that it needs it, but it's not in the active transportation plan as such. Um, there's probably some others I'm not thinking of, right? Ta Tasman, well, actually, maybe Tasman was in our plan. I don't know. If it was in our plan. Uh, no, we have a separate study issue. A separate, yeah. But it, it would be good to actually have this metric. Um, and so I was curious, how hard would that be to measure? I see. So, <laughs> let, me, let me answer that. So our ATP actually covers residential streets and non-residential streets. So one street that we were talking about that's underway is Java. So Java is not a residential street. Mm -hmm. uh, we have bike lanes throughout the entire city, whether it's residential or commercial or industrial. Um, so the ATP looked at the city holistically, how we can build a, a bicycle and pedestrian network that would be safe and, and um, usable by all ages and abilities, uh, not just in the residential neighborhoods. Um, it would be a little tough for us to break everything out by categories of streets because there will be a lot of overlap, like say Fair Oaks itself. Fair Oaks goes from residential, non-residential to industrial, and it covers all the different land type land uses. Um, so it would be like, uh, we'd have to do quite a bit of work and analytics to try to figure that out. Um, what, uh, what we, what we tried to do is just break it out by saying within the ATP that the bicycle committee, the commission helped us create and approved is that within that we have a goal for a certain amount of network. And that's what we're working towards right now. And then as a holistic goal, that's what, uh, we're trying to report on. We could, I think, uh, one thing that we could probably do is break out like maybe the all ages and abilities network. That may be a better metric in showing you how we're building the spine and how far along we are. And then that's what, once we build that, then that's really what unlocks everything else. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. That would be having that kind of thermometer of how close we're getting to like 100% of complete streets of the world. There's a bike definition and there's a walking definition. And those would be nice metrics to capture somehow to see where we are at. Okay. Um, we're running ADA compliant curb ramps. Um, are those, oh, let's see. So like, for instance, I saw a sidewalk project recently in my neighborhood where they re were rebuilding the sidewalks. And there was actually, a, there was a smashed curb at one location. It's like, I, I was confused. They just rebuilt it back as a regular curb rather than putting a um, cut there. And actually the opposite curb actually still needs repair. <laughs> um, when we do sidewalk projects, um, do they actually, some when they see something that, that obviously needs to be repaired, do they ever consider putting in curb ramps um, rather than just putting back the curb that exists? So I, it depends on how new um, the curb ramp is. Um, so 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 it, it is in de it depends. Um, but then for um, any of the older ramps that are not ADA compliant, then we would upgrade them. Well, this was where there wasn't any ramp at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but they needed to fix the curb because it was damaged when they did the sidewalk. And I was actually surprised they didn't take that opportunity to put in a ramp there because it would have been great. <laughs> As, you know, because they had to build, they had to redo the concrete anyways. So if you're referring to a maintenance, that would be a maintenance project. So as part of the maintenance, um, you know, they don't actively go out and, and install new curb ramps because um, the maintenance program is to maintain and repair what is existing you know, and, and make sure, you know, it's brought back to, and repair, you know, that is repaired. Okay. Um, and the fi my final question is, let's see, on the Sunnyvale Active Transportation Plan progress update slide, you said for a final copy of the report, search that um, transportation safety page. When you said report, did you mean just the original ATP or do, is there actually... Like this update. original ATP, correct? The adopted ah. one. Mm -hmm. is, um, this um, presentation just gave. It would be nice actually to put that as an update to that page, so people can say, "Oh, here's a report, and here's now progress toward that." Um, so they wouldn't have to search through all of our meeting notes and try to because that that I that think would be useful. Um, or you could put a link back to this presentation so they could actually see the commentary. But otherwise, they don't know that it exists, that we've had this great update. <laughs> that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Commissioner Dave. First of all, I'd like to say how stoked I am that we're starting improvements in two large industrial places that uh, people might want a bicycle to get to work and it's right currently kind of hazardous. One of them I think was the Matilda Mod, which is near all those new um, tech company developments, uh, and the other, I believe, was near to Moffitt Field, and both of those, I've known people who have had injuries there, a uh, guy lost his spleen near Moffitt, I am so happy to see that going in, and um, just thank you, and uh, could we look at each of those quickly, um, I don't want to spend too much time looking back at them, but I just want to kind of understand better what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then I have a longer question at the end. Um, so Tim, can you pull up the presentation? So this is on the bike in, um, I believe either, so we could start with the completed improvement slides. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe two slides before this. Is this the slide that you want to be on or? Uh, so there was the mod Matilda intersection. You briefly showed the, I think, pedestrian. Oh, okay. That is oh, the turn boxes. Uh, no, that is in the pedestrians um, oh. um, in progress. Oh. I believe uh, maybe like four or five slides later. Uh, maybe more actually. Okay, um, slide yeah, that's 17. It. That's it. So this is a concept design. Um, the consultant is working on, you know, completing the final design right now. 
So this is a conceptual plan. <laughs> But uh, yes, I understand that it's, you know, that it's a drawing, it's at the drawing stage. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the proposed landscape on that side, trying to understand, is that um, giving people more ways to get farther off the road? Um, I'm trying to understand, or is it a slope? What what's No, going currently on? there are something called Park Truck Island at that location. So what we, so where there's like a slip ramp that allow right turn movement, to make a right turn um, without necessarily completing stopping at the traffic signal. So they kind of. That's a gas station or something right now? It is a gas station, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, north is to the right. OK, and so um, the, the landscaping would make it uh, so that people would have to uh, leave the premises on specific lanes. So the um, whole idea is we wanted to remove the, uh, the pork chop island so that by doing so, um, we are, um, there's several reasons for it. One is we could shorten the crossing distance for pedestrian. Yeah. And then it's also um, reduce one of the crossing for pedestrian because with pork chop island, they have to first cross the right turn lane and then cross the intersection. Now they're only crossing the intersection. And then, and then also that would reduce the tra the travel speed, the vehicle speed when they make turns because the corner is tighter. So I uh, greatly appreciate that that's what's going on there because I think it will help cyclists and pedestrians. The island that's currently there um, is is tough on cyclists. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gl glad to see that might be changing. Yeah, so that's currently in the design phase. Okay, and then the Moffitt, uh, Moffitt Field Frontage Road, I think there was a, some- um, Yeah, so um, Tina, if you go, could go back to, I don't remember what slide it is. Um, um, yes, this one. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that was, uh, I don't remember when, presented to BPAC a couple of years ago. I think it was three. So currently there is a class one bike path um, on Moffitt Park between Laragus and Innovation. Yes. So the idea is um, it would be extended all the way to the city of Mountain View to Ellis. Great, 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 great. I'm glad to see that being connected up. I, I think there's like a little part in there where it's there's a sudden disconnect. And I'll be glad to see those things connected up. So this is also in the drawing phase, right? Um, I believe oh, this is a draw, like, you know, what you're seeing is the conceptual plan. It is in the design phase also. The design oh, actually, phase. it's oh, sure. finished design already. Yeah, um, I thought they were breaking ground. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting ready to break ground. What happened was that um, some Native Americans reached out to us and there's concern about some historical sites. So we are working with them right now. And um, I think construction is due to start very shortly. And then they'll have uh, some monitors all along the project while we're doing, while the contractors do an excavation. So if there is any archeological, potential archeological disturbances, they would be able to address it then? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, because I know when they were putting in the the recessed light rail tracks below the runway, um, they found archaeological um, Native American sites, and I met some of the guys then that were there to sort of monitor it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I understand. It's it's funny how many important things are happening in one area, <laughs> and I'm. Glad to hear that um, we're finding a balance. Okay, so my final question is, I know that finding funding is difficult no matter what job you're in and that um, thinking, how does the BPAC help the city of Sunnyvale find funding for these projects? Are we acting as sort of a little uh, review panel that might point out things that, uh, the bigger, the real review panel might object to or catch? <laughs> what is our role? Um, so 
in general, BPEC's um, role is to advise city council on policy, on bicycle and pedestrian um, related policy issues. So the actual, you know, like, um, if we're look, if we're if we're talking about looking for grant opportunities and stuff like that, that is not necessarily a policy issue. Um, so, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure certain if BPAC could play, you know, could advise or participate in a lot of that um, portion. Um, I'm thinking back to, uh, I don't know if it was last meeting or the meeting before that, we were sort of reviewing some of your plans for- OBAC uh, free application. That's the one. And right. I was thinking, was that, is that the sort of thing that could help, you know, apply for funding, meet funding uh, criteria, that sort of thing, or can we do something? I mean, we are, um, so typically we we do bring these projects and complete sheets to BPAC to review such that um, BPAC could, take a look at what is being considered and, you know, and make sure um, we're not missing, we're, you know, we're actually following the complete street policy to try to implement um, imp improvements that would benefit um, different users of the road. Okay, so that's the role of BPAC for that. Thank you, that helps me understand what, what we need to do to help this process. All right, I yield the floor. Thank you, Commissioner Deve. Um, my one question is um, the response regarding the um, bike lane compliant street sweeper um, seemed a, a tad vague. And I was wondering if there is a more definitive timeline that could be presented to us, if not now, then hopefully in an, a, a shortly in an upcoming meeting, which would give us an idea of when the city is actually going to actively seek out and obtain, uh, you know, research into obtaining a um, street sweeper, which will be compliant with uh, the bike lanes. Because um, so far that is our number one reason why we don't have necessarily more of the type of class of bike lanes that we wish to see is the fact that it, there's a street sweeping interference, or at least that's been my observation. So um, do we have a, a more definitive timeline on that other than maybe in a year or two? <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. Um, what, um... That study is really, um, I, I don't have dedicated staffing resources doing that. Each, um, my, as you can see, there's a long list of projects. Yes. Uh, we're kind of being pulled in every single direction, whether we're looking for grant money, we're looking to implement projects, or we're doing studies. Right. Um, it's all of my staff. We do, we do, we are working on it. We've met with other agencies. Uh, we're going to be setting up time to meet with city of San Jose and, and city of Cupertino for one-on-one -on -one discussion. Uh, but I think as far as like setting up a, a true hard deadline, uh, I've talked to the director and I've talked to the city manager about it. And um, at this time, there are um, quite a few things that are higher on the price that unfortunately kept on getting added on higher onto the priority list. Like when we need to go after a, grant funding that's not that I wasn't planning on right and then, and then when we get earmark money from the state or the federal government out of out of the blue or any grants then we need to start planning on budgets for that and delivery and schedules for that I understand it's a, a capital acquisition issue yeah. and um it's and, actually more than and, and well sorry. and personnel as well for running yeah. and and, and so forth but yeah. I don't want to end up making it into a study issue request. And that's why I'm trying to anticipate because we're trying to get to a certain goal within, uh, you know, within a, within a definitive time frame. And the more we keep pushing this out, the less likely we are to reach that goal. That is my concern. Yeah, and I, I understand. And then while we are working on, as you can see, we are still working on the, on the ATP, whether it's right. on the pedestrian side, the bicycle side, or the safe routes to school side. Right. There isn't a shortage of projects. Right. <laughs> it, it's, it's a different story than if we had no projects to update you on. Then I would definitely be saying, how come you're not working on this city? I'd be asking my staff that before right. it came to the VPAC. Right. Um, so it, just take it. I would 
and but on the staff side, we are working on things mm -hmm. and it is on our radar that it needs to be done because as you know, the mayor, when the mayor was the council liaison, mm -hmm. he would he would be here and then he would take note and then talk to the talk to the city manager at their one on one meeting that same week. Uh -huh. And then I would answer on that side of things. <laughs> But yeah, I, I know it's difficult. It's just that uh, my concern is, is that most of the bicycle infrastructure that we are looking at, even for major projects such as the, the undercrossings, is paint. And paint doesn't really protect people. I mean, it gives a visual cue, but it's not as good as a physical barrier or buffered bike, you know, bollard or buffered or, or planter protected bike lanes. And so... Um, especially for elementary school kids and stuff like that. I think parents want to see separation between vehicular traffic and um, cyclists. So I'm, I was just, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Well, I kind of do mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> but I don't mean to make you like, you know, swing in the wind kind of here. It's just that it was just disappointingly vague is, is my opinion on that. So, um, I mean, and so sometime, Within the next two years, I can guarantee I'm going to bring it up again. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and I I understand. And then okay. just just to clarify that it's more than just a street sweeper and staffing. Um, it it's also a striping truck to maintain the green paint and the right. stencils inside there. Right. And it's also looking at the impacts to our ESD Environmental Services Department for their access to storm drains, how everything else functions. So it is a bigger study. Right. Uh, just simple street sweeper. And uh, right. but we are, like I said, we, we do have it. I, it is on my radar. It's right. just unfortunately, we've got um, all these other projects and grant applications and grant funding. And it's a good problem to have, unfortunately, where we're talking, where I'm talking about on our side. I've got too much money coming in. Right. And I have to deliver more projects and I can't get to the study. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, you know, and I understand it has uh, repercussions in other areas, but yeah. the fact is, is we're talking about human life and that's, that's the primary, you know, um, safety point that we're looking at is the protection of human life. And if it's a prevent, uh, you know, my feeling is, is that most collisions are preventable in one way or another. And that our, you know, our goal as part of Vision Zero, as well as the ATP, is to um, reduce the amount of opportunities for those kinds of interactions. So I will leave you off with this. So, but thank you for being patient with uh, respect to that. But sure. I'm, I'm still going to poke. I understand. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. So now we have time for uh, comments from the commissioner. I believe Commissioner Haveman has had his hand up for eons, and then. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner Wee and Commissioner Mellinger, I did, oh, Mr. Ng, you have your hand up. <laughs> just, the only reason is just to remind you that you still need to open it up for the public comment. Yes, yeah, that's true. That. So I, I will open it up to the public. Do you, uh, I, I actually, I would like to open up to the public comment before we get to the commissioner final comment. Commissioner Wee, I see that finger. <laughs> so, um, well, let's see, hang on a second. Um, Actually, it, it just says questions or feedback is commissioners first. So I'm going to proceed with that for my script here. So we are going to the feedback portion with the commissioners. So Commissioner Haifman, um, do you have any further feedback? Uh, yeah, I actually have one question that I missed last time. And that is um, the uh, Class 3B bike lane. What is the definition in the city of Sunnyvale, what that needs to be done to convert a residential street, that's just a residential street, to a class 3B bike lane? Um, so for those locations, what we are, and typically they are in like lower traffic residential streets, lower speed streets. And so the imp improvements that we implement there would include um, central, uh, the, the, the center um, double center striping so that we could differentiate where the you know where the center of the, the road is and then if parking is allowed we um, typically would also do a parking stripe um, so that vehicles could see you know it, it visually they could see where the, the actual travel lane is so with that um, it gives the impression you know it gives the visual that the road is defined and vehicles would try to stay within the road and 
also um, travel at a lower speed to stay within the road. So just to add in that, that's not all that would really need to happen for a street to be classified as a class three bike boulevard. Um, there usually is some traffic calming elements some signs that go in. Uh, we would put in the bike route signs. Uh, there may be share the road signs. We may do curb extensions to, um, and traffic control changes to emphasize that the bicyclist um, should have the right of way and the bike, it's a bike boulevard. So what you're seeing right now, we haven't implemented any of the traffic calming elements yet because it's a maintenance project that we normally install these under, uh, like the slurry seal projects as what Lillian Missang updated you on. Um, so we only put in this two-way, uh, the, double, the double yellow center line and the shoulder stripes that go on the side of the road. Do you have plans on some of these streets to uh, block off car transportation across an intersection, much like they do in Palo Alto on their bike boulevards, so that it isn't used as an alternate automobile commute route, like Iowa is a perfect example. Iowa between Mary and Bernardo. I mean, that's a good alternate route to El Camino Real. And I know in Palo Alto, they have streets like that. And every so many blocks, they have a barrier. Car can't go on. So, so from yeah. being used that way. Mm -hmm. So usually that'll happen as part of a neighborhood traffic calming program. And we would need to work with the residents on that. Um, that's, there was quite an extensive public outreach from Palo Alto when they when they did that. It usually doesn't happen as part of a slurry seal or another maintenance aspect of a project. But yes, uh, there, we are looking at things like that and it could it may not necessarily be closing down the street. It could be changing the stop signs. So maybe the north south street stops instead of the east west street, if we're looking at like say Blair Avenue or Olive or Pastoria, not Pastoria, Olive uh, in front of City Hall and and running east or west, or maybe looking at Iowa, we change the stop signs in, on this uh, at some of the intersections. But there are a lot of different elements that we would look at as part of the full conversion of a street to make it into a bike boulevard. Okay, but it sounds like, you know, like in that table on page 14, it said like 0.1 mile of 3B was added. I think, in, yeah. And, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but. Um, it sounds like that was probably basically the striping. Yes. So it was the base, the basic portions of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Haifman. Um, Commissioner Wee, then Commissioner Mellinger. Oh, thank you, Chair. Whoops. You caught me off guard. I was expecting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Mellinger first. Hold on a second. Let me get my uh, notes back up here. Okay. Um, yeah, I had another uh, question for staff. Oh, and, and just one comment, by the way. Um, fantastic project, I mean, progress overall. I'm really impressed with the number of projects and uh, infrastructure improvements that we have going on. Um, very happy to see all this activity happening. So thank you very much and a job well done there. Um, back to the mode chair split, I was thinking a little more about that and I'd like a better way to measure that. And I was wondering if we had ever considered um, using streetlight data, which actually is capturing real-time continuous information on um, how people are moving about a city. And have we ever looked into that? Um, we did look into that. And um, the way we understood how the data works is um, they don't have counts at every location. So they use counts at various locations as a calibration tool. So it's not, necessary an actual number, but a lot of it has to do with calibrating to what they have and then kind of projecting out what other streets would look like. So well, let me just add a, a couple of things. Uh, based on city council discussion that I've had at council meetings and with other discussions uh, out of council with them, out of meetings, um, one of the biggest 
things that like I'll use council member Hendricks. He's asking us for data and he wants us to show data for all these bike lanes that we're building. Uh, and he's been pushing us for that. So one of the things that we're looking at is with our new video detection equipment, we're able to gather data and the cameras are able to distinguish and classify between vehicles, bikes, uh, and actually different types of vehicles. And then as a result of it, we can actually get a mode share of uh, users at an intersection, whether it's transit vehicles, uh, pedestrians walking, trucks, bicycles, motorcycles, or cars. And then uh, we're probably looking at deploying that, using that technology, and then helping us supplement and augment our data. And then at the same time, with all these new bicycle lanes that we're creating, we're thinking about how we can gather before and after data, showing how many users that we're attracting to these networks. And that was a direct reaction to Sunnyvale Avenue, where there is a very robust discussion at city council about, is this really going to make a big difference? And are we attracting um, bicyclists and changing the mode share? So we, we're looking at different types of data and how to collect um, the mode share, the bicycle counts and the pedestrian counts to see, to show council and the public that when we remove on-street parking or we remove a travel lane on Java, that what the effect of it is in the short term and the long term. Got it. Um, actually, I've got a little, uh, I've been running um, Bike to Work Day actually for the Bay Area as well as locally in Santa Clara County. So we have been actually gathering uh, metrics using Strava, which is just looking at bicyclists. And I've actually been pretty impressed with the Strava Metro platform, even though it measures just recreational cyclists. Um, what I need to calibrate that, and Colorado and some others have done studies on this, is I do would like some on-ground measurements and basically use those as calibration points for my Strava Metro data. And then I can, the, the Strava Metro stuff is continuous. It shows everything that's happening across the whole city or the whole county or the whole nine bear area. And it's very interesting. And I understand, I haven't seen street light data um, data yet directly. And I'm not quite as impressed with how they've done bicycle data, but they could actually give us a vehicle miles traveled by bike versus by car in a geographic area, which would be an interesting thing. And a different from account, but actually, you know, they could calculate mileage type things, I believe. I know Google is using them for their um, commute stuff and perhaps talking to Google and seeing how we could use that might be productive. I've been mainly looking at the bicycle stuff in my work with SVBC. And then again, that's um, Strava Metro is really cool for bike stuff. So I can actually give you relative counts on Sunnyvale of how many bikes were there. And it's not absolute, but the relative. And you can see the number of increases happening. So it's some um, pretty cool data to play with. Um, that's it for me. Thanks very much again. Great job, staff, on uh, all these improvements. I really appreciate all this infrastructure improvement. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Commissioner Mellinger. So I had one further comment on this, which is that in the future, I believe the BPAC would be well served by having this as a proper report and not merely as PowerPoint slides. Uh, I do not believe that PowerPoint slides are an acceptable substitute for a written progress report. And I understand that, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent presentation. I'm very impressed with the work that's been done. Um, but a written, there is no substitute for a written report that can be shared to council, that can be read by members of the public without having to watch the video for context. Uh, and so I would urge that for the future annual updates on not just on the active transportation plan, but on all the ongoing plans that the city has in motion, such as the climate action plan, such as Vision Zero, that there be a true written report laying out exactly what has been accomplished and what is on the docket. Um, the other thing that I would say is that in general for meetings like this, I do believe it would be appropriate to do this not as a study item, but as not as a study session, but as an agendized item so that the BPAC or again, other commissions that are dealing with similar documents may provide direct, may provide feedback in the form of a motion, advisory feedback. And so that is, uh, that is the only thing that I wanted to add. 
Uh, however, I'm extremely happy to see this progress moving forward and so many new, so much new bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure coming online in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mellinger. Um, again, I'd like to add my thanks before we get to the public comment again for showing us that um, it's sort of like it was the Sisyphean boulder going up the hill thing. And now it feels like now we're getting more of the stuff rolling down the other side rather than trying to push it up the hill. So it feels like we've kind of uh, you know, reached, gotten through the bottleneck, and now we're beginning to see some actual activity on on so many of the things that uh, we are uh, looking forward to seeing more of. Um, and yes, thank you for the presentation and taking the time out to to do such a, a thorough analysis. So, um, since we remain in the virtual city setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise hand feature or star nine on your telephone to indicate uh, if you wish to speak. Um, city staff will ask you to uh, unmute your microphone when it is your turn to address the uh, BPAC. Um, do we have any members of the public city staff that are wishing to speak on this item? I currently see none. Okay. Hopefully we didn't chase them all off. There were three people there once upon a time. Okay. Um, that uh, that's it. I guess that is the end for this presentation. I would like to propose a um, a brief break. Um, Chair we... Mellon, Chair Mellon? Mm. Um, there is a um, someone just raised their hands. In the oh, room. OK, I see. Uh, yes, they did. OK, so we do have a member of the public. I should have done the, the countdown like Richard used to do. <laughs> so um, if we could have that member of the public, uh, let's see if I can see who it is. Okay, so Nick, I will go ahead and unmute you. So, uh, yes, Nick. Okay, so you have three minutes. Me? Yes, I you can. You have three hear. minutes in which to speak. Great. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just, you know, here's myself today. And uh, I wanted to make a couple of comments regarding uh, some of the things I've heard. Uh, Strava Metro sounds great, um, but I've heard some criticisms about it that say, that it generally skews towards recreational, towards white middle-aged males. Uh, so when you want to go looking at that, be careful. <laughs> um, it's not covering everyone for sure. Um, uh, secondly, with regard to traffic calming measures, um, you know, there are a lot of stop signs in Sunnyvale. Has the city considered um, different forms of, you know, kind of low speed traffic control, like roundabouts because uh, they are generally safer. And um, and until California introduces the Idaho, Idaho stops, um, bicyclists are still not wanting to stop. And, you know, oftentimes you stop and then there's that uncomfortable jig where you're waiting for the car to go because it's their turn. And, and they're like waving you on and it's like, ah, why don't you just take your turn? Anyway, um, roundabouts. Uh, and the third one is, you know, a lot of the city spends a lot of time on studies prior to moving on various forms of bike and ped infrastructure. Um, other much larger cities have just thrown it in and, and you know, temporarily to see if it works. Um, cities like Paris have, have done vast numbers of little experiments. Um, is there any room in the city consciousness, I guess, to try experiments uh, for, like, for instance, the El Camino bike lanes, you know, it feels like you could, you could con something up in a day, um, you know, if you wanted to and see whether or not that improved the situation. Um, I realized that there are kind of like street sweeping and, you know, you know, uh, sewer access or whatever, but it's, it, it feels like studies often take longer than you'd want them to. And, and uh, they often form an excuse in some way, in some manner. So that's my my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Are there any other members of the public uh, wishing to address the commission on this agenda item? All right, seeing no other members of the public wishing to speak. Um, and since we have all commented on this, um, thank you again for the for the update on the report. Um, I would like to do a uh, brief 
since we've been here for over an hour, <laughs> um, uh, 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 90 minutes, I would say, actually, a uh, brief 10-minute uh, break. Um, and then we'll come back at uh, 7.55. Is that okay with everyone? All right, seeing no objections, I will adjourn for 10 minutes and resume at 7.55.
Welcome back, everybody. You caught me chewing. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, good. All right. Uh, we are resuming uh, the, the uh, BPAC meeting of 18 August 2022 with our next presentation item having formally closed public comment on the first presentation item 22-0845, which I forgot to mention previously. And so now we are moving on to presentation item 22-0846. VTA Measure B Education and Encouragement Potential Projects. Do we have a staff report? Yes, we do have a presentation for tonight. Um, I'm going to go over um, a, the presentations and give an update on the projects that we implemented using the VTA Measure B Bicycle and Pedestrian Education and Encouragement Program funding in the last fiscal year, as well as going over some of the proposed projects for this fiscal year. Um, next, please. So we, I'm going to give you a brief background of the program and then present to you some of the projects that we worked on last year and what we'll, we'll be work, what we're proposing to work on this this year. Um, the 2016 Measure B Bicycle and Pedestrian Education Encouragement Program covers activities that promote, educate, and encourage safe walking or bicycling for, uh, for residents or visitors of every age and ability. This funding comes from a 30 year sales tax that started in 2017 and will end in 2047. And it is not a competitive funding source. Um, each year, VTA, um, every two years, VTA would let us know um, the amount that we'll be um, obtaining for the upcoming two years. And the amounts would be different um, based on the amounts of sales tax that that are collected in those years. Next, please. Um, here is a list of projects that we completed in the last fiscal year, um, fiscal year 21-22, including bike ballet and bike rodeo um, at the Sunnyvale Art and Wine Festival. Um, for bike rodeo, it is a mini setup, um, like a setup of a mini city to teach children how to bike and walk safely. Um, on the lower right hand of the uh, page of the slide, you'll see a YouTube link um, that is a video of, um, of the bike rodeo that took place that day. Um, we also collected bicycle counts at six different locations. Um, we have purchased Safe Route to School incentive to encourage students to walk or row to school. And we have created table skirts and poster boards um, and um, also banners to publicize biking and walking. At, um, um, so the table skirt and poster boards to publicize biking and walking at city events. And um, we created Safe Route to School banners um, for school to hang up um, at the schools to encourage people to walk and bike. Um, so next, please. Here are the locations where we have collected bike and pet counts. Uh, moving, so these are the six locations. Moving forward, um, we plan to continue to collect counts at the same locations twice a year so that we can see the growth in um, biking and walking along these corridors year, year after year, and so that we could do a comparison. Next, please. Here are some of the Safe Route to School incentive and giveaways that we have purchased or in the process of purchasing, um, including some safety um, equipments for bicycling, um, as well as uh, as well as well um, pencils and, and backpacks for students. Next, please. In, here are some of the ongoing projects that staff is continuing to deliver in um, in fiscal year 2020, 22, in fiscal year 22-23, which is currently, uh, which includes um, bicycle safety workshop for middle school students and parents. As mentioned earlier, we'll continue to collect bicycle counts at um, the six locations. As more and more employees are returning to work for companies in, com in Sunnyvale, we plan to host energizing stations for bike to work days um, in the coming year. We will be purchasing um, hel helmets for, um, for distribution to students, and we will continue to develop a strategic and comprehensive marketing outreach plan for Vision Zero campaign. 
um, we will be creating a couple of education videos. Uh, the first one that we did some filming on um, a, a week last weekend is um, on how to navigate a pedestrian scramble signal. And another one that we'll be working on is to, um, we'll be focusing on providing safe tips for walking and bicycling. Um, we will be purchasing more safe route to school and bike related incentives um, to distribute um, to students and also to the public to encourage biking and walking. Next, please. For fiscal year 22-23, here are some of the projects that we're proposing to implement using the Measure B um, fund. Um, we wanted to host a walk to school day um, events to encourage students to walk to school in, um, in the pedestrian month, which is in October. And for the bike month in May, um, we are looking to host a bike to school day to encourage students to bike to school. Um, we are looking into creating more educational um, video um, for topics including how to make left turns using um, two-stage bike turn boxes, how to cross variant ty various types of intersections safely, and how to stay alert of your surroundings when um, biking and walking on, um, in the city. On, next slide. Uh, yes, this slide. Uh, we'll be also hosting bike rodeos and bike ballet at city events again. Um, from the last um, from the last fiscal year's experience, um, we realized that we do need to work closer with um, the events coordinators um, to figure out ways to better promote some of these events so that we could have um, more participants in the future. And we will also be looking at funding the Safe Route to School coordinator position to implement Safe Route to School programs and, and activities. And the city plans to implement targeted safety campaigns um, to promote safe driving, walking, and bicycling behaviors. And with that, um, it, that concludes my presentation. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any, any questions the commission might have. Um, Chair, Melan, Chair Melman, um, you're muted. <laughs> okay, thank you for that presentation. It looked very it looked like a lot of those events were very enjoyable. I am going to put myself first on the recognize on the question uh, section. And uh, again, uh, I would remind my fellow commissioners to uh, rate, use the virtual raise hand feature to indicate when they wish to speak. And I have you guys written down in order this time. <laughs> I was paying attention. So um, my first question is, is that um, since the purpose of the Measure B funding is to promote, educate, and encourage safe cycling and pedestrian, is any of that funding available for wayfinding sign installation to uh, enable cyclists to and pedestrians to find the appropriate routes or safe routes to navigate them easier? Unfortunately, no, because that is considered um, in infrastructure. Ah. Okay, so it, it, so the Measure B funding is strictly for ephemeral uh, things. It can't be anything that's a, a permanent infrastructure of any kind. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, for, right. this funding, for this Measure B funding source, correct. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you. Um, so the first up was Commissioner uh, Bonet followed by Commissioner Wee. Thank you, Chair Melman. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Sang, for the, for the report. Uh, three questions total. Uh, first, the walk and bike video. I think it's a great idea. That was also a topic mentioned at the VTA VPAC meeting two, two, two uh, weeks ago, that the, there is a great demand for on-demand bike training. However, I would suggest that you I wonder whether you've also looked around at what's available already. Do other cities have these videos available? I mean, it seems um, to beg the question, why duplicate effort when something's already existing? Um, to answer that question, um, a lot of times we want to make sure, because these are videos that will be posted on the city's YouTube website. So the city actually has a YouTube channel. So um, therefore, we won't be able to relate people to refer people to other jurisdictions videos. I see. Okay. Still, it, it 
um, even though the city has a YouTube channel, the city also has a website. So the there could be links on the city website to other sources of this information. Is that possible? That would be something that we need to check with communications. But from what I have seen on the city website, I don't believe we have currently we have been referencing anything from another source. Mm, OK. All right, uh, next on back to school. I think it's a great idea to encourage kids to bike, students to bike to school. However, I wonder whether May is the most appropriate time to do that when school is almost ending. Have you contemplated running this event in August and September during the beginning of the school year instead so that kids are reminded of it right now when they're starting school rather than when they're looking forward to summer and no longer have to bike? So part of the reason to do that in May is because it co coincide with Mike. May is the bike month, though it's just one sure. you know, like yeah. campaign. And then um, also at the beginning of the school year, so this likely will be run by the Safe Out to School Coordinator. And at the beginning of the school year, like the Safe Out to School Coordinator is busy trying to coordinate with every single school. So it would be she might not have the necessary bandwidth to actually. Um, um, to implement a program or an event at the, at the early stage of the year. Hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be all schools simultaneously, no? It could be staggered uh, over several week period. Is that possible? Um, this, I, I will have to check with our Safe After School coordinator on, the, on, on her timing and schedule. Hmm. How, much, how many personnel are available for this kind of event? One. Oh. <laughs> I see. All right. That puts a, a, a definite upper limit on the number of events for one day, doesn't it? Um, and the last question, uh, I was pleased to see that there is also attention to the, the enforcement side of traffic rather than on, not only building, but I wonder whether uh, that enforcement side includes additional emphasis on catching speeding cars and those not obeying stop signs and stop lights? Um, so these are, the, the if we were to use this funding source, it has to be bike and ped related. Isn't, um, aren't speeding cars a hazard to bicyclists? But this is related to education, right? So like the, the type of- Oh, okay. But yeah. the the last the last uh, part of that was enforcement. So how is how is enforcement education? Maybe I I don't understand the last slide. Let's see, um, some of the things that we are thinking uh, um, to do is potential. Where is it? Um, Oh, perhaps it's a simple matter of nomenclature yeah. rather than enforcement. It's an education campaign. Is that it? It is an education campaign, safety campaign. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. That's my last question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bonet. Next is Commissioner Wee, followed by Vice Chair Beagle. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, whereas our infra project, we're doing a lot and getting a lot accomplished. I, I'm, uh, Kind of um, disappointed with how well we've done on the programmatic side in the city of Sunnyvale. Um, it's great that we're doing bicycle valet. Um, so that we had it was set up, it was funded, um, but finding it, wow! I ran into some bicyclists who didn't know it existed and couldn't find it. And we got a little bit of a advertising orientation, and it certainly is important actually to have it on a consistent basis, as well as have it in a very obvious location so people know where to find it is a comment on the, uh, the the valley. I did use it, but I think I was like, there's two other bikes there. Um, in contrast to, I know at Los Altos, they parked um, a couple hundred bikes um, because um, they actually have a volunteer group that, that runs it and it's quite successful. Um, yeah, so we, we have our work cut out for us in changing Sunnyvale behavior and expectations to make sure that they buy into this. Because we certainly had a lot of people at the Art and Wine Festival. Um, Let's see, with the bicycle counts, I'm, I'm very pleased that we're doing counts and capturing data. Um, so I guess these 24 hour bike counts, so that's like you, that just you put up a special thing just for that 24 hours or are you using existing equipment to do that counting? Um, so we did hire a consultant to put out 
special equipment to collect these counts. Got it. Yeah, and uh, doing those on-ground counts is very important, both for streetlight data and for um, Strava. Um, in, in Colorado, they actually um, did a study using that kind of data, and they thought it was very important basically to have ground truth. So you could, you could look at that versus the data you get on these other big data things, just to make sure you calibrate them, because um, not everyone carries a cell phone, and um, the Strava does skew, but it does actually, it's a huge sample size. And uh, so it's, it's useful information as long as you can compare it to on-ground information. So I'm really glad we're capturing counts. I do hope that we can actually get some continuous counters. I know um, San Francisco has about 20 permanent locations where they're capturing continuous data year round. And then you can really see trends and, and they all get affected by weather events that could actually affect your one day count up or down or other transient things that it's just hard to uh, capture, um, which again, yeah, the uh, the other big data sources actually help you see the trends also over a long period of time, which is really nice. Um, for purchasing incentives to encourage students to walk or roll to school, is there a, a metric to see how effective those are? So um, we can understand so if they so have an impact. Are, yeah, we are required to um, to complete some kind of metrics um, for each of the programs that we do. And one of the ways that we are keeping track of collecting the, um, the, this metric is our Safe Route to School coordinator would collect, um, would do like a survey at the beginning of the school year to try to understand how students travel to school. <clears throat> And then um, I believe she was going to do it at the end of the school year also, so that she could do a comparison. Mm -hmm. So last year, I think she only did it once. So we don't necessarily have, a, I don't have the data, so I'll have to check with her. But yeah, but moving forward, she is going to you know, start continuing to do it on a, a annual, a biannual basis. The surveys are, are good starts, but sometimes what people say they're doing is not so actually what they're they're really doing. They sort of forget and or don't collect it. I do know of some schools that are doing um, more rigorous tracking and actually um, for a period of time, they're actually really seeing how many people really show up through some, they're actually using incentives. So you get to, you know, if you get so many um, check-ins and you show your bike or walk and you've checked in, then you kind of earn your prize and you're celebrated with that. Um, so I, I hope, I'm actually, it's, it's something that the parents have done in volunteer basis with schools and so it didn't, re it required some coordination to set up the, how it works, but then it kept going, which was really nice. Um, on the update for ongoing projects, the bicycle safety workshops for middle school students, I know that was set up. Unfortunately, those were, I, were canceled because they didn't get enough um, people signing up for them. Again, a marketing challenge because Cupertino it got actually really good uh, numbers for, for their similar courses um uh, going, we, you know, we, yeah we are doing a debrief on what how we could market it better yeah and palo alto has been very successful that's where it started actually palo alto did it cupertino started copying them and they're both going and menlo park also is doing pretty well and um bike to work where every day that did happen but i i don't think sunnyville staff actually participated at all in that this time around is that correct that is correct um i last year I believe it happened on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, so from our understanding, a lot of the companies were um, were not entirely come returned to the office yet. But we do foresee that in this upcoming year, more companies um, will require their employees to return to the office. Yeah. So, okay, that's great that in the future, Sunnyvale will participate. Because, yeah, there were several cities that did participate and had um, good results. Um, let's see. And oh, writing bike to school day. Um, there are counties, um, Santa Cruz and, um, so, um, let's see, Marin and Sonoma. They actually are doing a May, uh, September. Um, you know, they're doing both in the fall and the, the spring. Um, since May is bike month, which is a really good time to do it because you've got all this other infrastructure and all this other advertising you can piggyback on. Um, yet some are actually doing it around, or September, October, they're actually piggybacking on the pedestrian one. They're doing a walk and roll thing at both ends. Um, so that is uh, something that I hope we're able to get to at some point, because it, right when kids are starting school, it's nice to get them on a different track, as it were. Um, one final question, Have um, has Sunnyvale considered doing anything at the high school level? That is actually currently a hole in a lot of the bike education spaces, where a lot of people are 
biking to high schools, but um, I'm not seeing much done uh, to educate high school students versus middle and elementary school students. So my understanding is that our Safe Out to School coordinator mainly focuses on coordinating with, thing with elementary and middle schools, but less so with high schools. Um, I do need to find out the history of it, but then um, I believe that's mostly where her, coordin her coordination are is with the middle school and the elementary schools. Got it. Um, if there are dollars available, um, you can contract that out and it'd be very little work uh, just to set up a few um, high school training opportunities at, like Fremont and Homestead, which are the two prim main high schools to serve uh, Sunnyvale. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Beagle. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of this stuff is concerned with bicycles and pedestrians only. Uh, is there any room for the funding of these projects for other forms of active transportation, like scooters and skateboards? Like I ride the Caltrain to work, and there's almost some days there's almost as many electric scooters as there are bikes on the train. So it's becoming more and more popular for other forms of transportation. Uh, is there room in the funding for these for education involving these other transportation modes? Uh, I so based on the agreement, um, likely not, because the agreements, um, the funding agreement that we have with BTA, um, specifically mentioned bicycle and pedestrian related activities. Uh, is that something that we could push for them to expand in the future through our, like BTA representative or? Mm -hmm. It might be something we could um, check with VTA. Okay. So, yeah. so let me add in that the Measure B program is actually codified into, into law and was specific language was voted on by the voters. Um, so they are, VTA is holding very firmly to it uh, because they are, they, they want to be accountable for spending of, of the Measure B tax dollars and then make sure that the residents and the sales tax user, the sales tax uh, producers or the public that's putting in the sales tax is knows that we are spending the money responsibly per the per the the letter of the vote and the measure sales tax measure. So we can't ask them, but I've tried on other items. The chances are they're not going to want to give towards it. Um, we do incorporate um, when we talk about bikes and pedestrians, we do kind of cover the manual scooters because that's part of the role side of things as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, but the school age children are not able to operate a electric scooter per vehicle code laws. You have to be, you have to have a driver's license. And then um, it, it plays into a couple other things that we don't wanna go into because of we can't, as a city, we can't go into because of liability side of things. If we start educating people, students or children on, on electric scooters. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Thanks for the info. Um, sure. You mentioned sometimes scooters with the rolling. Uh, is there any, like, does that also include skateboards and stuff? Yeah, skateboards, okay. rollerbladings, roller skating, and sco manual scooters. Got it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Beagle. Do we have any other commissioners wishing to ask any questions? Uh, seeing none, um, we'll move to the, uh, we, do we have city staff, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? I would remind the members of the public, since we do remain in a virtual setting, uh, use the virtual raise hand feature or dial star nine on a telephone to indicate when you wish to speak. City staff will ask you to unmute your microphone when it is your turn to address the BPAC. Um, Chairperson Melman, can you open up <laughs> the public um, comment? period for this item. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm Now we will formally open up the public comment period. So do we have any members? I thought I had said that. Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? I currently see none. 
Okay, as a countdown of uh, five, four, three, two, one. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak, um, we will now close the public comment portion of this item. Okay, moving on to the consent calendar. Item 220830. Uh, since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask my colleagues to use the virtual raise hand feature to indicate when they wish to speak. City staff, do we have any, Ooh, sorry. Uh, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on the consent calendar? Um. I, I'm, I, you know, moment. I believe that it says public first and then motion for the colleague second. So if the script is wrong, that's what I'm following. The here. next item should be oral communications. Oh, sorry, you're quite right. Let's see, I think I'm going here. This is what I get for following a script. <laughs> okay. A reminder to the public please raise your digital hand or dial star nine on the telephone if you wish to address the BPAC. On a topic that is not on tonight's agenda, city staff will ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address the BPAC. And so now is the time for oral communications. Do we have anybody, any of the commissioners wishing to speak on oral communications? Chair recognizes Commissioner Hafeman. Actually, I raised my hand because I thought we were on the consent calendar. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll leave it up though. Yeah, the problem is, is too many pages. <laughs> um, okay, um, so we, okay. Um, and this uh, oral communications is a, a, provides an opportunity for members of the public to address the BPAC. Um, and right now it appears we have no members of the public wishing to speak on oral communications. Um, the, the, we get to that in our general comments section later on, BPAC Commissioner. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> All right, now we move on to the consent calendar. <laughs> and I'm formally closing the oral commu public comment on oral communications, Ms. Sang, just so we note that. <laughs> All right, um, now we move on to con con mm, the consent calendar, item 220830 which is uh, to approve the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission meeting minutes of July 21st. Um, Chair Melman, uh, Chairperson Melman. Yeah. So we, this month we do have two items on, in the consent calendar. Um, so if no commissioners would want to pull an item from the either one of those items. Um, commission oh, we do have, yeah, I see now on, pay, on the second page that we um, have. As a brief. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, um, just a second, Commissioner Mellinger. Um, did you have, did you wish to address the chair as, as, uh, as a suggestion in this regard? Yes. Um, given the recusals that prompted the need for two separate meetings, I would suggest that we dispense with these items separately as the recused members should likely abstain from the, from voting on the items that they did not participate in. Yes, and since we have all members present who are able to vote, we have still have a quorum for approval of those minutes. So um, the first one was the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission meeting minutes of 21 July 2002, which included the um, Sunnyvale Avenue undercrossing. So at present, are there any commissioners which need to recuse themselves um, on, the, on that item? Uh, the Sunnyvale Avenue one, correct? Yes, first one, yes. Sunnyvale Avenue. I will, I will be recusing myself from that. Okay, so if uh, Vice Chair Beagle, or do we have any other members that need to recuse? Commissioner DeVay? Is this uh, uh, as of the last meeting or as of the current? This is specific to the Sunnyvale Avenue undercrossing meeting of June, July 21st, not the, not the Mary Avenue undercrossing meeting. Okay. Because I wasn't uh, there to attend that one, should I recuse myself for this? Uh, because I have no knowledge of what transpired on the 21st. Yes, you can be an abstention. Oh, okay. This is why does this have to Sorry. be so complex? Sorry. So <laughs> the reason I was asking is because I moved from one 
undercrossing to another undercrossing. At the time that you were a commissioner voting on this item, were you affected by the need to recuse yourself from no. the Sunny Bill? Okay. Then you may remain. I have one, I have one clarification. So uh. the action tonight is really to approve the minutes. So it has, because it has nothing to do with, so um, basically it's whether the commission agree with the minutes or not. So you're saying as a member of, of order um, that there is no need to recuse any of the members who did not actually attend the meeting from voting. They can just say they abstain. Um, I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. Because it's not an action to change any of the decision that was made. This is more approving the minutes for the meeting. Okay, and is that what you were going to say, Commissioner Weiss, as I saw the head nod? And yes, and in, in general, actually, for approving minutes, um, whether you attend the meeting or not, you can still say, I approve of them. That's um, true. It has no harm. Um, and But some people choose to abstain. Right, right. So you have the option to abstain if you do not wish to approve the minutes. It's it's OK. So nobody will be recused for this. So therefore, do we have a motion regarding the minutes of can we do we have to do them separately or can we do them in aggregate? Um, it is the commission's decision. I would propose that um, we do them in aggregate if that's OK with the rest of the commission. Uh, hearing no... your motion. Okay. Um, I've had my hand have general well. consensus to do. I'm sorry, Commissioner Hafen. Do we have general consensus to do the approval in aggregate? Okay. It appears we do. All right. So therefore, I am. Uh, we're moving on to uh, items two two zero eight three zero and two uh, two. Uh, we actually do need to vote. Yeah, we will vote. I, I'm I'm getting there. We're going to vote in aggregate on both the uh, meeting minutes. Is there confusion on that? Sorry, I thought you said we were moving on from this. No, uh, no, I hadn't. You I hadn't finished speaking. <laughs> so. Do we have a motion regarding the consent calendar items 220830 and 220842? I actually would like Hafen. to pull one of those. Hmm? I'd like to pull one of those. We I have an, I found an error on the July meeting. Okay. Um, which error? Uh, you can you can still vote to approve. Uh, well, yeah, okay. So, um, which needs correcting in the July meeting? On page nine of the meeting, I was called Chair Hafman. And I don't think I've ever been chair of this <laughs> even for a minute. If that is corrected, I would like to. I would like to move. No, no, no. You were never at any time appointed or a chair. So, can we please correct Commissioner Hafman's title within the meeting minutes for the July twenty-second uh, meeting minutes? I hope the um, issue did not repeat itself during August. Oh, uh, it did not. So you say page nine. Page nine of the July meeting minutes, nine of 40. Oh, now I'm gonna have to go back through and. I'm sorry, that's nine of the, of the packet. I'm sorry. Page nine of the packet. Yes. Okay, let's see if we can. Uh, two thirds of the way down, it says Chair Hafman asked the following should say Commissioner Hafman asked the following. So you did ask those questions. It's just identif misidentifying your title. That is correct. Yeah, okay. that's page two of the minutes. Oh, I, I see it. Okay, do we have any other um, corrections or issues which need to be addressed in the July 21st meeting minutes? Okay, 
So the meetings will be updated appropriately with Commissioner Haveman's correct title for the questions which were asked on that uh, page. Will do. Okay. Therefore, do we have a motion? I'm sorry? I'm ready to move that we approve the consent calendar uh, with so, the correction as identified. Okay, so restating again, uh, approving the, is there a motion to approve consent calendar 220830, which is the meeting minutes of July 21st and the consent calendar of 220842, the meeting minutes of August 1st. Now, Commissioner Haifman. <laughs> I move to approve the consent calendar. For the we seconds. Okay. And that is for the two dates specified, correct? For okay. both dates specified, yes. All right. All right. Having been moved and seconded, do we have a, can we have a roll call vote, please, for city staff? City staff, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Haifman? Yes. Commissioner Bonet? Yes. Commissioner Mel Mellinger? Yes. Vice Chair Beagle? Yes. Chair Melman? Yes. Commissioner Dave? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Owe? Yes. So the motion will carry was seven yes. Okay. Okay. Having completed the consent calendar, hang on a second, let me just go back to the agenda here. Um, we move on to public hearings or general, bin, biz, mm, general business. If you wish to speak to public hearing general business items, please refer to, uh, please raise your, use the virtual raise hand feature or use star nine on your phone. Each speaker is limited to a maximum of three minutes. So the public general business item that we are uh, bring, we have here is uh, 220847, report and discussion of recent Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting, committee meeting, sorry. Do we have a report? I have a uh, verbal summary from the meeting I attended, yes. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bonet, if you would please do so. Okay, this is from the meeting of 10th August, 2022. Um, it was a, a fully attended meeting. The first item of discussion was the underpass at Blossom Hill and 101 that is opening soon. This was funded by highway funds, not bicycle funds, interesting to note. BTA announced that they're extending their hours to coincide with the beginning of the school year. And second or third, there was a, a public information campaign that the VTA is implementing to highlight that uh, a few safety issues, in particular that driver assault is a crime. Um, they're trying to improve the relations between the yard workers and the VTA management by implementing yard visits so that um, suggestions for improvement come from the people in the yards and to reinforce the idea that VTA is a good place to work. Uh, next item was an update on measure B, which we've discussed here also. So the, the first topic under measure B items was that there is a vision zero plan funding opportunity due September 12, 2022. And they also spent a fair amount of time discussing how bicycle education can be implemented and how the public should or could access uh, bicycle education and what the VTA can do there. So they first off recognized that this on-demand recognition, education is a recognized need. And there were uh, several suggestions. One, there's a Bike East Day, that's a live webinar on how to prevent theft of bicycles, which this was represent, uh, recommended by Chair Banerjee. <clears throat> and there are also a Silicon Valley Bike Coalition webinar on the four main checks of a bicycle, meaning 
they're summarized in ABC quick air and wheels brakes chain gears and quick that the quick release skewer is secure. So their goal is to make bike education more available for anyone who wants it. And one of the members, member Wadler, recommended a book called, or a handbook called Street Smarts, which is um, devoted to bicyc safe bicycle riding. And another recommendation came uh, Cycling Savvy, which is a Florida series of training videos. And they seem also to publish the, the booklet Street Smarts. Next, uh, Jane Shin, who is a transportation engineer, uh, presented the VTA request to shift Measure B funds from a Los Gatos location to another in Los Gatos, namely from the Kennedy Road sidewalk to a Highway 9 pedestrian pathway connector to the Los Gatos Creek Trail. And this trail connector has already received 3 million in OBAG funds. However, the town was still short of funds to fully fund the project. Hence, the VTA would like to move funds to assist the town. Uh, in response to my question, is shifting funds allowed under Measure B? And I got the answer, yes, it is. And then the vote was asked on whether the, whether the, the BPAC members approve that, and it was passed. Uh, next, we had a presentation by Ian Lin, one of the transportation planners on countrywide or countywide, sorry, transportation demand management research. So this TDM, transportation demand management, it aims to incentivize a mode shift to non-single vehicle occupant trips. And they have um, eight strategies which they're contemplating in order to accomplish this goal. First is marketing, a website highlighting the ease of biking, public transport and ride sharing. Uh, next would be live data on bike share possibilities shown for San Jose. Uh, third would be education, the merits of biking, walking and ride share. Fourth is to try to shift the public's attitude, um, in particular to young people, meaning and they were thinking of focusing on the idea that a car at, not, at age 16 is not necessarily the coolest thing you can do anymore. Rather, maybe it's a scooter or an electric bike or biking with your friends or simply taking the train with a group of friends. Uh, fifth, they have a traveler rewards program, which they're contemplating to reward a move away from single driver cars. Uh, sixth, they have a participation in something called MTC Merge. These are five Bay Area counties which are consolidating rideshare data, which uh, seems like a, an excellent idea. Anything we can do to gather more data about how people are actually uh, being transported is, it, it seems useful to all participants in the VTA umbrella. Uh, seventh was they encourage employers to begin their own programs for mode shifting. And eighth, they are investigating means of on-demand mobility to bridge the last mile and the first mile, which is often a, a, a difficult step in using public transport. Uh, next, there was some other business. Um, one of the departing members of the VTA, um, whose name may be familiar here, Tim Owe, he requested to remain on the wayfinding committee. A vote was made to approve that and it resoundingly passed. Um, next, the BPAC work plan was presented by Lauren Ledbetter and she reviewed three things. One, there are many countywide programs um, currently underway and recommended for priority area grants. There are apparently 58 applications uh, totaling $650 million if all of them were to be funded. However, unfortunately, only $120 million are available to allocate and most will be um, designated for complete streets. Uh, 
Next, there was a, a Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition Bike Summit that was to happen um, next week, speaking from the time frame of this meeting. So that would have been this week. Today. <laughs> and third and last, there is a, she mentioned that the Santa Clara Prune Ridge Complete Streets Project, which is apparently the only two mile stretch on Prune Ridge without a bicycle facility, this one in Santa Clara. Uh, she encouraged members of the public to contact the city to speak in favor of it because it is apparently facing much neighborhood opposition. And following that, the meeting ended. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that we don't have any staff reports related to uh, any public hearing or general business items. Not for this item. I didn't think so. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item, city staff? I, okay. I, see, I see none. Okay, seeing none. Uh, we will close the public uh, comment portion of this item and move on to uh, the next item, which is a standing item, consideration of potential study issues. Chair Chairman, Chair mm. for moment, um, Commissioner Owe has his hands up. Uh, Commissioner Wee. Uh, thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, regarding the education items that uh, were mentioned, um, the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition has a, an education page dedicated to education. It's got on-demand training there in many different forms, as well as uh, a bunch of classes that are coming up. So if you go to uh, bikesiliconvalley.org slash education, that's to enhance the uh, report on all the education alternatives that exists. Um, and I'm surprised the SUVC representative didn't mention that in the, the report that uh, Commissioner Bonet just gave. It's just a, a flag on this report. Thank you. Thank you. Now, moving on to our next standing item, which is consideration of potential study issues. Do we have, do we have a staff report on that? Um, I don't believe so. Uh, now, and do any commissioners wish to comment on the standing item uh, of the potential study issues? Nope. All right, um, I don't believe there's a, uh, public comment section ap applicable to that. So, um, and since there are no members of the public present anymore that I can see, um, we will proceed now to the non-agenda items and comments. Do we have? Sorry, can uh, going back to the sending item, um, can I make an announcement? So, um, just for the record, so we do have um, one. Um, study so issue paper that was submitted that we will be bringing to city council, uh, bringing to BPAC for consideration next month. That is one that Commissioner Mellinger um, submitted. Okay. It, it, um, the other thing to mention is that in September, we will be doing our first round of um, study issue sponsorship. Um, so, just information. Uh, so, just a reminder. And also a reminder that um, to be considered um, in in the in scenario one in the September um, sponsorship, the study issue form needs to be submitted by August 9th, which was passed already. Right, I was <laughs> gonna say, I think we've already- To be considered um, in the October 20, in the October BPAC meeting, um, study issue paper um, the study issue form needs to be submitted to staff by September 13th of this month. Okay, so okay. noted. Uh, moving on to non-agenda <laughs> items and comments. Do we have any commissioner comments? And since we remain in a virtual setting, I will once again ask my colleagues to virtually raise their hands and um, if they wish to speak. Um, I see that Commissioner Mellinger had his hand up first, followed by Commissioner Wee, and then Commissioner Haifman in that order. I actually had a question about the study issue uh, process. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Why are but, you doing this to me? No. Yeah, well, uh, I think it works here. Yeah. Um, would it be, since we're going to have a study issue coming up in September, at least one, um, would it be possible, would it make sense to simply do a single ranking session in October rather than ranking in September and then ranking in October? 
Okay, so um, for the ones that the commission decides to sponsor in September, staff would have time to prepare um, the study issue paper to be brought back to the BPAC ah. review in, I believe, let me double check the timeline, but um, maybe in the November meeting or so, but I, let me double check on the timeline. But then if we, for, for anything that are sponsored in October, um, staff would not have enough time to prepare that um, I see. Right up. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do we have any more questions pertaining to study issues at this point? <laughs> All right. Now we will move on to the non agenda items and comments. Uh, Commissioner Wee, you're first, followed by Commissioner Aethan. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so I did attend the Silicon Valley Bike Summit today. And it was very successful. Um, 200 people there from all over the Bay Area and some people coming from elsewhere. Some people came from um, Colorado and from Southern California. It was um, quite a good event with lots of useful information. Um, I also attended the California Bike Summit earlier. And this is basically not just Silicon Valley, but basically it was like a Bay Area bike summit. Um, there was a lot of representation there, a lot of uh, consultants and city people. And some highlights, um, Caltrans District 4 director spoke there and talked a lot about um, a complete streets and El Camino's Grand Boulevard initiative that they're hoping to see um, come to fruition at some point, which uh, that would be awesome to see that corridor and turned into a better bikeway. And uh, our VTA uh, folks were um, explicitly uh, uh, given kudos for their bike superhighway approach um, that they're pursuing with parts of El Camino Rail um, and to look at that. Um, so there are uh, this um that the superhighway is one of the I think one of the first in the state being considered and looked at. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of that happening in District 4. There's a lot of other things I'm just forgetting about uh on the Caltrans uh, uh District 4 director. Um there was a very interesting dialogue between two executive directors, um, East Bay Bike Coalition and the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. And they were gonna have the San Francisco Bike Coalition executive director come also, but unfortunately, actually a couple of speakers and some of the moderators and some attendees um, got hit by COVID. So they weren't able to attend. So there was a few of the key speakers didn't make it. Um, yeah, basically running a bike coalition is uh, very rewarding, uh, but a lot of work, and they need more funding, and they need more people. <laughs> but they're getting a lot done, regardless. Um, so that was interesting. There, I went on a ride that went through the infrastructure around Millbrae, and it was very interesting seeing how different cities and different jurisdictions um, handle infrastructure. Um, they went on some um, bike lanes, as well as um, bike boulevards, and and there were some deficiencies as well as um, good things. They, they stopped, like one developer um, is doing a great job with um, affordable housing right next to the Millbrae BART station where they have excellent bike accommodations. Uh, um, they will have excellent bike accommodations when open. So they're still in the process of developing it. That was interesting. Um, there was a really good e-bike um, discussion with um, uh, people for bikes representing the whole industry in the United States about their respective e-bikes. And um, there was a great study that um, Peninsula, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy did to see the impact of e-bikes. And whereas we're having more trouble getting people to mode shift uh, from cars to bikes, um, on the e-bike side, they were seeing like a 30% uh, success rate with people using their program to get e-bikes of actually stopping driving their car to shift to e-bikes which was like, wow, that is great data um, showing that people are really latching into e-bikes and it's proving to be very effective at getting people out of their cars and switching. Um, there were some Pecha Kuchas, which are really, really fast presentations. It's um, 20 slides with 20 seconds for each of those 20 slides. So you've got to go really rapid fire through them. Um, the most interesting one was a um, green complete streets presentation by April Webstrat of Mountain View, where she, um, recounted the um, how rather than just doing complete streets, she's talking about green complete streets with um, vegetation and capturing water and with bioswales and trees and how it's a really a virtuous cycle and making literally making it much more attractive for bikers and walkers along um, areas. So not just putting, you know, concrete down as a bike lane, but then putting the trees in 
really makes it much more effective and attractive um, and they get much better results. Um, so I hope we see more of those in our area. See, I think, um, oh, I forget the jurisdiction locally in the Bay Area that was doing, but Vancouver has done a lot of it. Seattle has done a lot of it. Um, and there was some, maybe was San Mateo, city of San Mateo. There was one other city, I don't recall it right off the top of my head accurately, um, that is starting to do these as well. So um, I hope to see more of our complete streets become green complete streets because it just, um, yeah, it was very inspiring. And there was a, a couple other speakers that spoke on that as well. Um, and yeah, Omar Din was going to be there, but I wasn't able to help facilitate, I think because of COVID, one of the other COVID casualties. So, or maybe he's just busy with some, he's very busy. Uh, and so that's an update on that. Oh, and, and just, just to plug the education page again for Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, there is a ton of education available currently that's happening live right now. And I encourage our commissioners to take um, Smart Selecting Part 2 will actually come back to Sunnyvale on September 11th at Homestead High School. So if you really want to um, make sure your skills are up to snuff or have any friends, um, our staff also are invited. Um, you can take Part 1 online. There's several options. There's also um, uh, training that you can take uh, via live uh, classroom for Part 1 of Smart Cycling. And then Part 2 of Smart Cycling will be coming back to Sunnyvale for, for a second time on September 11th. And the great opportunity for more of the members of um, the public and anyone else who wants to uh, make sure they know how to bike safely in just about any kind of traffic condition. Thanks very much. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Commissioner Haifman. Thank you. Um, I just have a detail. I know you noted that I was three minutes late to this meeting, mm. but the fact is I, I actually connected 15 minutes early but it kept saying waiting to be let in. And then when I was let in, I was let in as a member of the public. That's never happened to me before. And by the time that got fixed and I was here with video, it, indeed I was three minutes late. Okay, it's, it's not a bad reflection on you. It's just noting for the, for the public, for the calendar, that's all. So it's not like you get a, a mark on the permanent record. So um, I have some announcements to make. Um, upcoming our um, eighth annual Bike the Bay Area 2022 on Saturday, September 10th, 10th sorry, starting up at the San Francisco Ferry Building. Um, there are um, multiple routes throughout the Bay Area. And then um, also coming up is a day on the Bay, Bike to the Bay 2022, just to make you more confused, which is on October 8th, starting at Plaza del Sol, which is a uh, ride led by uh, Supervisor Otto Lee to the um, we'll gathering at Plaza del Sol and then traveling through uh, the bike routes in Sunnyvale to the Alviso uh, recreation area. So something I definitely encourage people to, to attend as a fun thing to do. Um, and plus there's oodles of stuff um, at, the, at the end um, in terms of information on um, greenway cycling. A few years ago, I got a free flu shot there. There's all sorts of stuff that's uh, very useful. That's not just um, transportation related, um, but also um, find out more about the um, programs and um, uh, um, in, informational um, things about the county and the city. So, um, and that's all I have to say on that. And uh, next is Commissioner Dave, followed by Commissioner Wee. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I heard somebody comment earlier that uh, to ride an e-scooter, it's required to have a driver's license, and that's. I'm wondering, did I mishear something? Because I, my son, who was below 18 years old or below driving age at the time, did used to drive his e-scooter to school. And when I looked up the law, the only thing I saw was that uh, below the age of 18, you're required to wear a helmet. So I don't understand. Can somebody revisit that and explain it better to me? Um, I think you'd have to check the vehicle codes. <laughs> yeah, I did. I couldn't find it off the bat, so. Uh, okay. It was something in regards to educating people about scooters. Um, so we'll, 
Um, sorry. So we'll 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 send you the link okay. um, either off out of the meeting or we'll uh, let you know at the next meeting what the what the vehicle code section is. But it isn't the vehicle code specifically saying um, users have to be 18 years or or not necessarily 18, but they have to have a driver's license in order to to operate a motor an electric scooter. I know. And right after that, it says that if they're under 18, they have to wear a helmet. It's like, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Wee. Oh, thank you, Chair. I forgot one thing, my long laundry list of <laughs> items to mention. Um, there hey, is Strava, one more time. I'll hit. <laughs> Bike to the Future is happening on September 18th. And there do um, there are two augmented reality locations on that ride where you get to see the existing conditions without the augmented reality and you pull out your phone you can see what the plans are and just move around and look at how it will look after they um, do the implementation so that'll be a very interesting ride if you can participate on them bike to the future um, there's a 10 mile that's just viva calle itself it's during during happening during viva calle um, there's a 25 mile which is mostly trail and there's a 50 mile which is mostly trail and it's covering um, the southern, uh, going, last year it went from um, San Jose and then headed west. This time it's starting downtown San Jose and heading south for the longer rides. Um, so if you want to see what augmented reality is like on a bike ride, um, check it out for how infrastructure is being handled. Thank you. That sounds very intriguing. <laughs> uh, and I forgot to mention that the Day on the Bay information is at allevents.in sunny slash sunnyvale and that's for the uh day on the bay bike to the bay and then the um actual bike uh bike the bay is uh its own separate website which is um i, I believe available on www.bikethebayarea.com so if you want more information on either one of those events and i should have mentioned the websites as part of my announcements um staffed do you have any comments? I have a few. Um, the Java Drive Road Dive project, um, the construction for that project was awarded by city council last week. Um, the Caltrain race separation projects will be brought to city council for consideration on August 30th. The Homestead Road um, bike lane study will have its first online public outreach meeting on the next Thursday, August 25th, between 6 to 7 p.m. You can find the meeting info on the city website by visiting the transportation projects page. There is also a subscribe button, um, link there where you can subscribe to the mailing list. And once you're subscribed to it, you will be re receiving um, future project updates via email. And those are all the comment announcements I have. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, um, that's so much for um, non-agenda items and comments. Uh, moving on, we have the information only report items. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments regarding the annual work plan, the active items list, uh, any 2022 deferred study issues or 2023 proposed study issues? Seeing none, uh, I believe at this point, we are ready to adjourn this meeting of the 18th of August BPAC. I do not having a hammer like Richard, I bang my staple to formally adjourn this meeting. And I woke up the cat. <laughs> yeah. Poor cat. Hi, folks. Thanks everybody. Thank I you. Have a good night. <laughs>